Ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you very much for joining us this evening. Um, uh, and um, I just thought I'd tell you a little bit about what to expect this evening before we proceed to the main event. Um, first of all, welcome to the Hippodrome. We're incredibly grateful um, to all the staff and the owner of the Hippodrome um, for letting us use this venue space. Uh, it's a fantastic space, as you can see. It's not the first event we've done here, but we're incredibly grateful to all the people here, uh, Craig, Ian, Simon, um, Loretta, um, all the people for, for, for putting on this um, fantastic uh, event for us. Um, uh, ben Dilo um, has paid for the, the free drinks uh, in the first part of the evening. I hope you've all had a free drink. Uh, well done, ben. Thank you, Ben. Um, and uh, the bar will remain open um, at the end of the event, but I'm afraid you'll have to pay for the drinks um, after the event, after this part of the event has finished. But th the bar will remain open till 10.30, so if you want to hang out afterwards, that's absolutely fine. Um, so in a minute, I'll introduce Lionel, um, and then um, uh, I'll ask Lionel some questions about the book. Fantastic book, just read it, thoroughly recommended. Um, and, um, and then Lionel will do a reading from the book, and then we'll throw it open to you, and you can ask Lionel questions, and then people at home watching at home, we'll have an opportunity, welcome to you guys too, uh, to ask Lionel some questions. Um, and then uh, we aim to wrap up at about nine o'clock. So um, without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, put your hands together for Lionel Shriver. So I thought I'd just begin by um, reading out um, the blurb about Mania, Lionel's new book, um, for those of you who haven't yet read it, um, uh, although I'm sure you're going to, um, uh, just, just, just so you can um, perhaps just to, to give our discussion a bit of context. So uh, it begins, in a reality, in, in a reality uh, not too distant from our own, the so-called mental parity movement has taken hold and the worst thing you can call someone is stupid. Everyone is equally clever, and discrimination based on intelligence is the last great civil rights fight. Exams and grades are all discarded, and smartphones are rebranded. Children are expelled for saying the S word, stupid, and encouraged to report parents for using it. You don't need any qualifications at all to be a doctor. Best friends since adolescence, Pearson and Emery, find themselves on opposing sides of this new culture war. So the narrator is called Pearson and her best friend is Emery. Radio personality Emery, who has built her career riding the tide of popular thought, makes increasingly hardline statements, while for her part, Pearson believes the whole mental parity movement is ludicrous. As their friendship fractures, Pearson's determination to cling on to the old, bigoted way of thinking begins to endanger her job, her safety, and even her family. Lionel turns her piercing gaze on the policing of opinion and intellect and imagines a world in which intellectual meritocracy is heresy. Hilarious, deadpan, scathing, and at times frighteningly plausible, mania will delight the many fans of her fiction and journalism alike. So that's the description of the book. Um, and. Um, uh, it, uh, as it sounds, it's, um, it's a satire. I think probably reasonable to call it a dystopian satire because it does, even though it begins in 2011, it stretches into the future. A dystopian satire about... Um, oh, the... I, I think we've demonstrated already that you can have a dystopia in the present. Okay. <laughs> That's true. Um, but um, uh, fair to describe it as a satire of the various manias moral panics um, that have characterized uh, the 21st century, um, uh, uh, in particular, I guess, the transgenderism cult, um, the uh, lockdown cult, um, maybe um, wokeism. Me uh, too. Me too. BLM. Um, BLM. So I've, I've got some questions um, for you, Lionel. I mean, my first question is, why begin in 2011? Is that when you think the rot really began to set in? Well, I wanted to comment on the general phenomenon of the social hysteria 
uh, but I didn't necessarily want to tackle or run into all the social hysterias that happened one after another within a period of about 10 years. And so I wanted to get in behind them. And I identified that transgenderism really started taking off in 2012. That's when I remember all these documentaries suddenly hitting our TV screens about little boys in dresses. And um, it, had, it had a strangely crisp beginning. So I, I didn't want to get into transgenderism, I, or Me Too, or Black Lives Matter, or the lockdowns, or for that matter, even uh, the climate hysteria. I, so it wasn't arbitrary, that date. It starts in 2011. And that way, none of these other manias happen, except there is lockdowns, and that's because stupid people are in control. <laughs> yes. I mean... Uh, I noticed that, and it was sort of, it, it, one of one of the one of one of the book is full of very good jokes, and one of the jokes is that the reason we responded to lockdown as we in fact did in 2020 is because the mental parity cult had already done its damage, mm -hmm. and all the intelligent people in kind of public health and public policy had been kind of weeded out and replaced by idiots. Yes. Um, but in fact, um, that didn't actually happen, and yet we did respond in what seemed well, to be a pretty brain-dead way. I mean, you can read that in more than one way, but you can also read that to mean, actually, that's already happened, and those were the people who were making the decisions. They didn't even need the mental parity movement. <laughs> Um, uh, and that's, you know, that's how we got to know each other was over lockdown. Yes. In fact, one of the nice, one of the only nice things for me about lockdown was finding fellow travelers. <laughs> um, I wanted to actually, well, the book, the book is um, quite bleak. Uh, one of the um, more bleak passages um, towards the end um, which if I can find, um, uh, it, it seems to be um, Pearson having reached quite a kind of pessimistic, jaundiced conclusion about Western society. Mm -hmm. And Pearson writes, a wide variety of historical phenomena that once confounded me now seem explicable, if not ordained. I'm no longer astonished by the Holocaust and there's no country in the world that I would deem impervious to the modern equivalent of a Nazi takeover. Rather, I figure that full-blown fascism in, say, the US, the UK, Australia, France, or modern Germany, for that matter, could manifest itself within approximately three weeks. Uh, Mao's cultural revolution, Stalin's labor camps, Cambodia's killing fields, they now strike me as perfectly normal. Was that, was that, um, is that a conclusion you've reluctantly reached post-2020, or did you have a pretty jaundiced view of humanity and Western society already? I wasn't that far away. Anyone who has read my previous books uh, realizes that I'm not um, little Nancy cheerful. Um, but I, I, had, I did have a very strong reaction to COVID in particular, and of course, that's just shorthand for the COVID lockdowns and all the other nonsense that went with it. The disease is neither here nor there. Um, and it did uh, deeply disillusion me about our species. Um, we start with the species and then move on. It also uh, discouraged me about the nature of liberal democracy. Uh, overnight, it became neither liberal nor democratic. Uh, and that's literally overnight. That's what's so weird. Literally overnight. One day, we had civil rights, and the next day, we didn't. And every, virtually everyone went along with it. It's like, oh, OK. Oh, I can't leave the house. OK. I'll check the TV schedule. And I, it, I, I, I was so floored. And I have to say, I was especially floored by this country. Uh, and a little encouraged by mine in that there were some protests in the United States, not nearly as many as you would have expected, but there, there were a few people who said, we're not having it. And that was a relief. 
that may be proud to be an American. I was quite surprised by, shocked by the response of the Australian authorities and the willingness of most ordinary Australians to comply with the new authoritarian edicts. I'd always thought of Australians as being particularly rebellious and ornery and individualistic, um, partly because in my, my head they're all descended from criminals. Um, <laughs> but I think Clive James once said it's a mistake to think of Australians as descended from people who were sent to Australia when it was a penal colony. Think of Australia as being uh, people by people dis descended from um, prison officers. And that, that made much more sense when you thought of it like that. Um, but, but the narrator's, the narrator's conclusion about humanity and the narrator's pessimism about the future of the West seems to go hand in hand with a sense that the West has declined quite significantly mm -hmm. in the past 25 to 50 years. Uh, there's one passage in which you, you try and characterize one aspect of this decline, which is in throwing in our lot with what we will to be true rather than with what is true, we break with the scientific method through which all advanced economies have achieved their prosperity, a method whose previous practitioners were willing to brave the discovery of the ideologically inconvenient. And it seems to me you're, you are putting your finger on something there, which is the corruption of science and scientists. Mm -hmm. And that was something which particularly stood out during the pandemic and the response to the pandemic. Were you surprised by um, how few antibodies scientists and the scientific community had for that particular mania? Had scientists been able to better withstand these moral panics previously? Do you think? Um, I think scientists have not uh, fared very well through any of this. Um, they have cooperated in enforcing ideology with the media and the state, and, uh, and often in defiance of the evidence. You know, look at the nonsense with masks, you know, flip-flopping on masks, and, the, and just as absolute as, as, you know, the people you run into in the supermarket who got hysterical because you slipped underneath your nose. Um, and, and they weren't interested in the evidence. I mean, if you looked at the um, Center for Disease Control website explaining their evidence for why we were supposed to wear a mask, it was all based on some ridiculous study of a couple of hairdressers, one of whom had worn a mask, and like one or two more of, of her, I don't know what you call them, hairdressees, um, didn't get sick. I mean, it, 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 it was the most scientifically absurd with no control group, right? I, I, and, and yet you didn't have scientists making fun of it. They kept their mouths shut. And this was the case across the board. And um, I think in some ways, one of the most appalling uh, examples of the betrayal of science by scientists, and I, I mean scientists broadly, and by which I mean I include doctors. You know, now we've got the CAST review, right? And lo and behold, it turns out that castrating and mutilating your children isn't a good idea. <laughs> I'm so glad we finally had a study, you know? And now it's a big surprise. These, these are doctors who are doing this. They know that the research it's based on is rubbish. I mean, there basically isn't any. And they're still doing it. And I think that in, in some instances, it may even be worse than just going along with something they know they're supposed to go along with. I sometimes suspect that these surgeons are having fun. You know, ooh, it looks like a penis. Can I make it a little more? It's like they, they become sculptors. 
it's, it's, it's very upsetting that the people that, you are that are supposed to be the guardians of fact and reality have abandoned both in, in the face of any of these manias. And that means there really is no protection. There is no, we don't have an expert class. As much as we often defer to them, they are as susceptible to social hysteria as anyone else, and that means we're all on our own. And I think that's what a lot of us found out during COVID, and that's why we found each other. It looks as though in the wake of the CAS review, there's a certain amount of um, uh, U-turning on the part of the advocates of um, trans identity ideology, um, gender identity ideology. Even, even Stonewall is beginning to row back a bit from some of the excesses of trans rights activism. And we saw that, we see that too with the, with the lockdowns, um, people now claiming that they were never that enthusiastic uh -huh. about them. It, 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 there's, there's, there's never any kind of one, of, one of the kind of frustrating things for people like you and I is that the people who um, vilified us um, for opposing the lockdowns are not, hold, not in any way held to account. There's no, there's no cross-examination, there's no mere culpa, there's no admission that they got it wrong, rather they just pretend that they were never on the other side of the aisle. Oh, well, this is... Uh, and this is a feature This of, is a feature of, of the social mania. Yeah. Um, the people who stuck their necks out and got their heads cut off don't get their heads put back on. <laughs> um, no one thanks them. They're never recognized. No one ever apologizes. All the people were who were wrong never acknowledged that they were wrong. There is never a point at which the people who are responsible for pushing this stuff off on everyone else say that was a mistake, much less they're sorry. Nobody who has been injured in the process of trying to stick up for the truth is ever made whole. And all the people who went along with it sooner or later pretend they were never into that, you know? And then a weird amnesia sets in and it's as if it never happened. And this is just across the board and applies to all of them. I mean, even if we haven't talked about Me Too, but uh, there were a lot of men, okay, I think we all accept that the, the two or three cases at the beginning of that movement, those guys had it coming, fine. But a lot, of, a lot of men further into that movement, as it got more hysterical and more petty and, and, and super sensitive, were, they, their careers were ruined. Their reputations were ruined. I have never seen anything in, in the press saying, oh, we were wrong, sorry, that was extreme, you really weren't that bad, it was merely a hand on the knee, or you know, it, it was a, a single unwanted kiss, or maybe it was even a little bit wanted. None of that. I'm, no apologies, nothing. You know, and again, it's just, it's just gets smoothed over. And as a consequence, it's, it's really disconcerting when you were one of the people who, who, with all of these things, saying, hold on here, can we get a grip? You know, you just don't get any credit. And, and there are a lot of people whose careers are still profoundly damaged from any, no, from any of these things. And <laughs> there are no reparations. There, there, it, it's, 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 uh, it's profoundly unjust on, on every lev level. So if you're, if you're looking for satisfaction, if you're looking to, to be able to say, I told you so, you never get an opportunity, except tonight. <laughs> <laughs> um, you said in a recent piece in Unheard that um, the um, panic about climate change, which seems to have been going on now for some time, um, had all the hallmarks of a mania. Um, uh, that made me feel quite optimistic that actually at some point, the, 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 the steam is going to run out and all the climate hysterics um, are going to retreat a little bit and perhaps we won't have to face absolute 
ruination as a result of the dogged pursuit of net zero. Do these, some of these manies take place along different timescales? I mean, some seem to kind of Clearly. leap up and subside quite quickly, but the climate change, I mean, how long do we have to wait before that particular mania begins to subside, do you think? Um, well, once, once ordinary people are facing the real costs, I think it's going to yeah. fall apart very quickly. And also, once politicians are facing the fundamental dysfunction that they are inviting for their countries, which, given these absurd deadlines they've, they've placed in, in the climate agenda, could actually, the rebellion could happen on their watch. You know, po politicians get away with murder because they're short-termers, and, and therefore the consequences of their stupid policies don't really usually come due uh, until they're out of office. So it's like, it's not me. <laughs> Um, but, you know, this whole thing of uh, ditching petrol cars is not going to work. It is not working now. And they're going to have to keep moving the, the goalposts further out. And the bottom line is the whole thing is, is absurd. Don't have the electricity. Don't, don't have the, um, the rare metals. Uh, don't have the copper. Don't don't have the stuff. It's not it's not practical. Also, don't have the chargers. The whole thing is is all on paper, so that's going to fall apart. So practicality does catch up with ideology eventually. The real problem with climate change, of course, is financial. Uh, that even in the scientific community, people are so invested financially and reputationally in, in the truth of climate hysteria that it's going to be really difficult to dislodge these people. Perhaps we should reassure them that actually, just as Neil Ferguson's reputation hasn't suffered in the slightest, in spite of getting everything completely wrong, mm -hmm. if they turn out to be wrong, then actually the reputations won't suffer at all. Um, as we were discussing just previously, um, you've created the cult of mental parity to be kind of deliberately over the top. It's sort of... I don't think it is. Well, I, I was going to ask you, I mean, it, it's, it, it, are there in fact signs that um, uh, we're in the midst of uh, a mania along those lines, a kind of excessive intellectual egalitarianism? I mean, lots of um, uh, uh, prestigious US colleges have done away with entrance exams, they don't want to see people's SAT scores anymore. Um, Scrabble has just um, invented a new game called Scrabble Together, which is more inclusive, i.e. much less intellectually demanding, so all the family can play. Um, <laughs> including uh, infants. Including, <laughs> including yeah. And, and not only do you not have to actually know, you don't have to create any words from scratch, but you don't have to add up the score of the words. So it's for enumerate people as well as illiterate people. Um, <laughs> But um, uh, to what extent do you worry that what you've intended to be satire will all too quickly become true, the kind of Titanium McGrath syndrome? Well, in relation to, uh, you know, merit, there is already a war on merit. And uh, if, in, in terms of worrying about uh, the viability of my plot, I was mostly worried about reality overtaking my plot. And then it's like, well, of course there's no such thing as stupid. What, what kind of a silly premise is that? Um, and you're right, there are, uh, there are major universities are not using standardized tests anymore, although there's now, they're going back. Harvard just switched over. They're going back to using standardized tests. Mm -hmm. MIT went back to standardized tests. Um, and, and I think we're going to see that increasingly. Uh, so I felt I was addressing a, a problem in, that is very much present day. Uh, but I think we discussed this. Um, the worry for me in my premise was that my mental parity movement would be too easily conflated with Black Lives Matter. And 
it would be possible to maliciously construe it as trying somehow to say that black people are stupid. And that was the last thing I wanted to do. And in fact, I, I deliberately planted a couple of things in the book to make it clear to the reader that is not the intention. Uh, Pearson, is, the protagonist, is an instructor in a university, and her very best student is black, and his career is being destroyed and flattened because he, is, he, can't, he can't distinguish himself. So, and there are a couple of other little signs like, don't, don't misinterpret me here. One of the um, strands, the sort of central strand, narrative strand of the book is um, these two best friends, Pearson and Emery, um, who gradually fall out because Emery, being much better socially adjusted than Pearson, um, quickly um, uh, becomes um, an advocate for mental parity, um, whereas Pearson remains stubbornly opposed. Um, I wondered how autobiographical that was. Have you yourself experienced those kinds of betrayals or fallings out with um, close friends because they've been swept up by a particular mania? Yes. Yes, I've lost a couple of close friends uh, because of the current political climate. And uh, one of the things that I wrote this book for is I am absolutely certain I am not the only one, perhaps even in this room, who has also lost friends over politics in the last 10 or 15 years. And I mean, if, if you have counterexamples, I'm happy to hear them. But in my experience, it is always the, the friend to the left who ditches the friend to the right. Yes? <laughs> Now, I have personally, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't give my friends purity tests. Um, so, you know, they, they, I'm not saying I, would, I, I w would put up with any behavior in any position from any of my friends, but they'd have to really, really push it. I mean, they'd have to be making human skin lampshades. <laughs> <laughs> and... Um, so not to be glib, I, I have found those experiences of losing friends extremely painful. And simply telling myself, oh, you know, it's, it's the political times. It, it still feels intensely personal. It doesn't just rationalizing it as having to do with, with ideology doesn't, doesn't make it hurt any less. You know, I, I had known these people for many years, and I thought we understood each other. I thought we forgave, gave each other our differences, or for that matter, enjoyed each other's differences. There is such a thing. I knew the person I'm thinking of right now, I, I, I knew that she w was more left-wing. That was fine. Almost all my friends are more left-wing than I am. In other words, I have friends. <laughs> um, <laughs> And I was deeply disappointed, and and that was a loss. And I feel that I'm surrounded by a lot of a lot of people who are suffering similar losses, and wondering how this happened, and why is why is political loyalty uh, beating out personal loyalty, and 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 to me that's that's a profound corruption. In some ways, it's it's the most profound corruption, even more so than you know, the kind of corruption that we're talking about with science and the way people are behaving professionally, the way people are behaving personally and spurning people whom they, were so, they ostensibly cared about because of transgenderism or something. It's, it's wasteful and destructive and irreparable because once the mania is over, the friendship doesn't get back together. And... When, when that happened to you, I mean, it happened to me when I was cancelled in 2018, though not, not on a large scale. But when it happened to me, it felt like the people I regarded as friends who denounced me on Twitter or 
in newspapers and magazines, um, were doing it partly for strategic reasons, to preserve their own careers, that mm -hmm. they didn't want to be contaminated by association with this now toxic figure. It's more that, isn't it, than that they disapprove of your views. It's more a kind of performative disapproval to kind of protect their own careers? Or are they so swept up by the mania that actually they do feel a kind of visceral, intense dislike of anyone who doesn't share their political, ideological views? Well, I'm sure it depends on person to person, but uh, in the moment of disavowal, there is a great rising of um, righteousness and, and a sense of purpose and principle. That's one of the creepy things about it. Um, but I think the deeper motivation is usually, and I, again, I'm thinking of this same person, it, it has to do with not wanting to be associated with someone like me, that it's too dangerous, and that it's going to be a professional detriment. You know, it will get out. So you don't know her, you're not, you're not, you know, you're friends with her, are you kidding me? Not worth it. Um, so uh, you're right, and there's a suggestion in the novel also that uh, Emery, the, the friend, at a certain point, who's, she's very ambitious, she's made it from radio to television, um, and it is not in her interest to be associated with a, with a pariah. And, and that's a calculation that a lot of people have made, especially during these cancellation things. And it's, you know, which is very public. That's the whole point of it. Mm -hmm. It's incredibly public. And you, you know, I'm sorry to hear you've lost friends. Have you got any of them back? They sometimes sort of um, greet me at parties as if it never happened. A bit uh, like the way yes. Emery greets Pearson in the sort of yes. final scene. It's as, though, it's as though they haven't performed this grotesque public act of betrayal and yes. behaved disgracefully and thrown you under a bus. It's as though, yeah. let's just... And you don't remember. Happened. Of course you don't remember. <laughs> and I, I, I worked out that um, the best way to make them feel guilty is to play along with it and be incredibly charming, if you can, to be incredibly charming idea. and gracious. And then they feel about that small. That's, right. um, <laughs> That's really mean. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, one of the things I could relate to in the novel is Pearson spends quite a lot of time puzzling over whether Emery has just embraced the mental parity movement for completely careerist, self-interested reasons, or whether she's actually been swept up in it and now is a true believer. Um, and it sort of seems as though she starts out um, doing it, embracing it for more cynical reasons, but then becomes swept up by it. Yes. And it, it, it's often quite difficult to tell, isn't it? It's one of the kind of mysterious things I find about people who are swept up by these manias, particularly smart people who you used to be friends with, um, is, is, is it just that they, that they have calculated that it's going to help them if they go along with this kind of mania? Or have they actually been swept up by it? Or is that a meaningless distinction? Do they kind of persuade themselves to believe whatever is in their self-interest to believe? And they're just better at doing that because they're clever. I don't think it's a meaningless distinction, but I do think it's a long segue in, in the case of a lot of people in, in relation to Emery. Uh, that's what I intended. It, it, it is a, in her interest to at least ape the convictions of the mental parity movement. But she does it for long enough and in public enough that first off, it does become hard to tell, in fact, impossible to tell. But eventually, I think she does believe it. And that's because it's too much effort. It's too much, it takes too much energy to keep a Chinese wall down the middle of your own head. And I don't think there are very many people who parrot this stuff, whatever the mania happens to be, uh, and are secretly cynical within themselves and don't believe it. I think that's, that is an interim state, but it, it cannot last for long because 
it's mentally exhausting. And you have to live with your own perfidy. Yeah. You know, you're lying, basically. Yeah. And that's painful. If you have any kind of conscience, it's painful to lie. And so it's a lot easier just to get with the program and decide you buy it. And that's one of the that's one of the weird things about when whole populations get caught up with something. I mean, I I do. I find myself wondering about North Korea. And they have to watch it. So they can't let out any suggestion that they that the dear leader is not everything, the very the God that he's supposed to be. You, you watch those people, sometimes they're interviewed. I mean, do they, do they really believe it? Do they know whether they believe it themselves? Can they tell the difference? I don't know. You know, with Putin, do they all think he's God's gift? Do they, do they really think they're, that Ukraine is taking over, is Nazi? I don't know, but it's easier to believe. It's always easier. Part of this is a kind of laziness. Mm -hmm. I, I experienced this on a small scale. I remember trying to get my eldest child into a Church of England primary school, and to do that had to go to the local church and sort of masquerade as a pious Christian, and the pews were absolutely full of other middle-class parents doing exactly the same thing. <laughs> I don't think there was a single practicing Christian in the entire church when I first arrived. But I, I noticed... They were all Muslim. But I noticed, I noticed as, as, as time went on, after about a... And we had to stay there. It wasn't enough just to go a couple of times. I mean, it was... Um, uh, I noticed that most of them did become pious Christians by the, by, within about a year. Wow. Because the psychic cost, as you say, of admitting to yourself that you're being hypocritical was too great. It was mm -hmm. easier mm -hmm. to just believe. And I thought this must be why, you know, the, the, the vicars tolerate um, uh, this masquerade because they know actually they're going to get a few souls at the end of the day. Anyway, um, should we have um, a reading from sure. the book, Lionel, um, before, the, before we go out to the audience uh, for, for their questions? Um, do you want to set this up or do you want me to set this up? I'm happy to set this okay. up. As mentioned, uh, Pearson, who's uh, here in the first person, has uh, been teaching uh, in the English department. And out of sheer mischief, she has introduced her uh, international literature intro course to uh, a, a new book on their uh, course list. They have to read The Idiot. Um, and then she's hauled in to the um, Dean of Cognitive Equality. <laughs> and that's the scene. Tastefully made up, Dean Poot might have been attractive for a woman in her 40s, but her structured suit was a washed-out pink drained of any vestige of softness or femininity. Her gear exhibited that cornered, brass-buttoned look of designer collections on grand department stores' top floors, though I'd never understood why anyone would pay so much to look so sexless. I wondered if, out of hours, she'd rehearsed that emotionless expression in the mirror because few people could pull off such implacable blankness without practice. Gosh, I said, bustling in, wrapped in my scarf and puffer coat, even resting my backpack on the immaculate ivory carpet seemed like vandalism. It looks as if it might snow, but the forecast, have a seat, please. I did as I was told. The padded black leather chair before her desk was of a modern style that flung one backward in a position I associated with getting my teeth cleaned. <laughs> it lay close to the floor while Poot was seated much higher and upright. Later, I considered how differently this interview might have proceeded had we swapped chairs. 
you're aware there has been a complaint? Yes, I gather one of my Intlit students took exception to a novel on my reading list. I hadn't taken off my coat, and now I was stuck in it. More than one student, Ms. Converse. I'm sorry to hear that. But the novel, you were surely aware that the assignment would be perceived as deliberately provocative. This can't be a surprise. I wouldn't call it provocative so much as playful. Besides, college-level courses should try to provoke students, to get them to think, to question. Let me put it away, another way, then, Poot said. You had to have known that the assignment would upset, offend, insult, and disturb your students. That it would cast doubt on their instructor's sense of fairness and decency. That it would make them anxious about whether they were being taught by someone with extremist political views. <laughs> I think that may be piling a bit too much baggage on poor Fyodor in 1869. The complaint was not about Dostoevsky, but about you. I gather you subbed this book in for another at the last minute. Why, Ms. Converse, did you choose that book? I had to stop myself from responding spontaneously because I wasn't supposed to. It's one of the great classics of Russian literature. And I never once said the title aloud. Why would that make the slightest difference? She had a point there. I guess it wouldn't much. According to one complainant, you've sometimes objected that the only text much of the class ever reads of your assignments is the title. Got that right, I muttered. And the title is a slur. I attempted to regroup. Look, I thought the whole point of the novel would resonate with contemporary sensibilities. All the other characters regard Prince Mishkin as, a, as someone who's clueless. I wasn't confident we were supposed to say clueless. Who's inferior. But he's actually the wisest character. You regard wisdom as occurring in people to differing degrees. I mean, Mishkin is unfairly cast as pitiable. He's good, he's virtuous. His innocence and his belief in the goodness of others and his belief in their capacity for redemption is regarded by others as a sign there's something wrong with him. So he becomes a martyr. You could say this so-called I-word is the ultimate champion of alternative processing. I wasn't confident we were supposed to say alternative processing anymore either. When Poot just sat there, I carried on. The same misguidedness is editing out Shakespearean fools. I'm sorry about saying the F word, but it's a traditional role in dramaturgy that we still don't have a replacement term for. In King Lear, as in so many Shakespearean plays, the, um, the fool, is superior to the regal characters, and the fool's jokes are at the ruling class's expense. The fool is the truth teller. It's the very opposite of a pejorative stereotype. To say Poot's expression during this mini lit crick lecture was tolerant would have been too generous. She wore the look of a television viewer waiting for the advertisements to finish. Meanwhile, I'd managed to get down the zipper of my puffer coat, but I was still sweltering, and I worried my face was sweaty. Sick of being thrust back as if to get my molars polished, I struggled up to perch on the edge of the chair, but that tipped it forward on its chrome skis, and I was in danger of flipping it on top of me. Besides, I went on shakily, is it in the interest of mental parody? to rewrite the past, for us to appreciate the importance of pursuing cognitive equality, 
We have to also appreciate how viciously people with perceived mental deficiency have been treated historically, don't we? If we erase all the slurs, we also erase our progress. We need to retain reminders of past wrongs to give ourselves credit for redressing them. More silence. She must have known as well as I did that the longer I talked, the higher the likelihood that I would hang myself. I shut up. You're merely an instructor here, is that correct? Poot said at last. You're not tenured, or even tenure track. Well, I'm more interested in roll-up-your-sleeves teaching than in the whole research and publishing thing. And you're aware that this office has considerable powers, that the cognitive equality complaints procedure is not mere empty theater to placate whiny students. Well, I'd never call them whiny. Yet all I'm hearing is that you're unrepentant. There we were. Wade and I had three children. We had a wonderful house with a mortgage. VU was the best regarded institution of higher education in the city. If I left its employ under a cloud, I've had a, I'd have a dastardly time finding a position elsewhere. And no one had forced me to assign that novel. I had done this to myself. Should dire consequences ensue from a childish act of impetuosity, one of the many people who'd have no sympathy for me was me. No longer fighting the chair, I slid back into my position of submission, though now the feeling was less dental than gynecological. <laughs> no, I'm nothing but repentant, I said, hanging my head and clasping my hands piously in my lap. I deeply regret having selected that assignment. Having had time to think about it, I now realize that the title of the novel alone made the selection needlessly hurtful and inconsiderate of my students' feelings. I have no idea what got into me, but I'd like to assure you that this kind of rash misjudgment isn't like me, not at all, and I will never, ever make a mistake of this magnitude again. I'm more than willing to personally apologize to each of the complainants, as well as to the class of, as a whole. I'd understand if you conclude I don't deserve it, but I'd welcome a second chance to prove that I'm a fierce advocate of mental parity and that I strongly believe every single one of my students is every bit the intellectual equal of every other. I looked up, and for the first time that afternoon, Diane Poot displayed a hint of feeling. Her eyebrows had lifted a quarter inch in approval. But if her expression meant, go on, I wasn't sure how much more of this crawling on my belly like a reptile I could keep up. I just mean, I'm sorry, I wrapped up lamely. Really, really, really sorry. The impotence of amplifiers vary extremely, and the peculiar manner in which they backfire, making one, for example, seem, if anything, less than especially sorry, was one of the lessons I taught in freshman composition. Dean Poot said she would write up her report, and I would be hearing from the administration shortly, though something in her freshly self-satisfied bearing seemed to indicate that the abasement was a success. I remembered to take my scarf and knapsack. My dignity, of course, remained behind. As a postscript, this was still only 2013. The protocol had yet to be established, but in short order, profuse apologies for any perceived violation of mental parity doctrine would only dig one's grave deeper. Were this same interview conducted a year later, 
Diane Poot would have encouraged me to blither my regret, shame, and desperation to make amends, amends for at least another 10 minutes, after which I'd have been fired on the spot. Well, for those of you who'd like uh, a signed copy, um, they'll be on sale just over there. Um, and Lana will be remaining behind after the Q&A on stage, so you'll just queue up just there um, uh, to sign, sign your copies. Um, and I should also say that if any of you are hungry, um, there are two restaurants in the Hippodrome, the Heliot Steakhouse and Chop Chop, Chinese restaurant opposite. Um, and if you just show them the e-ticket you bought in order to come here tonight, you can get a 20% discount at both of those restaurants, and I'd, I'd recommend both. Um, so, can we have the first question? We've got two uh, people with microphones. We've got Vinay and Felice with microphones, so if you'll just wait for them to come to you. I think, Lady in the Glasses, you had your hands up first, so there's Vinay with the mic just to your... There you go. Thank you. Um, I'm interested, um, Lionel, um, how much you blame this new world on the corporate world. And I'm thinking about um, the Royal Mail, um, the post office actually, sorry, forgive me, um, for lying so much, allegedly lying, about their sub-postmasters and kept to the... Um, absolute line, the horizon, there was nothing wrong with it. Um, and the corporate world now has to stick to lines. Um, most of or a large proportion of the working population work for corporates. So they have to absolutely um, go along with this group think. I wouldn't call the post office scandal exactly in, uh, caused by social hysteria. I think that's ordinary corporate lying to protect their self-interest. And we've always had that. So that's not new. In fact, it's comfortingly, comfortingly old-fashioned. <laughs> we are dealing with a larger corporate problem. And it's just, it's just, it's the same I said about science. And th the problem is, we talk about our, our institutions, and I always picture a big building, right? No, institutions are not made of buildings. Institutions are made of people, and that includes corporations. Corporations are just a bunch of people. It doesn't exist as an entity. It is a, it is a crowd, a, a, a crowd within a hierarchy. So it's people, and they're just as corruptible as anyone else. I'm afraid corp the corporate world is not especially known for its bravery and for risking reputation uh, for, for principle. The weirdest thing now is that they are real, they, in the guise of principle, they're willing to risk losing money. I think that's the biggest mystery that's going on with the go woke, go broke business. So that you've got, you've got, uh, People at the top in league with, you know, really hip advertising firms, and they are labeling themselves in a way as to alienate most of their customer base. And I find that utterly mysterious. My read of that is they're trying to demonstrate their piety to the kind of woke cult. If but they're not willing to, to their customers. If they're willing to sacrifice profits, it shows just how dedicated they are to the woke cause. <laughs> They have to believe it's in their self-interest, but I don't understand what the equation is, okay. right? I mean, if you look at Bud, I mean, there is no product on earth that is more, you know, at least, at least in its veneer, working class. What on earth were they doing bringing on that transgender twit to <laughs> advertise that beer? I mean, that's mentally deranged. <laughs> There was a question, I think, um, a, a, a man, a gentleman has his hand up just over here. Um, do you mind putting your hand up again, sir? Oh, there's oh, one in the front row. Vinay. Lionel, with reference to the pieces you wrote on the Spectator about the theoretical foundation of currencies, crypto and, re and real, what are your economic qualifications? <laughs> I don't have any. 
<laughs> then uh, may I ask what you're doing whilst you've got a second look to a spectator? Um, it's, not the same, it's not the same sort of thing as this, uh, of what you're writing out in the book. Effectively, uh, you've got no more economic qualifications in writing about, writing about economics. Um, I should clarify that uh, my 2016 novel, The Mandibles, is entirely economic in nature. It's about the fall of the dollar. And in order to write that book, I read a whole stack of economics books so I'm not saying that I have some kind of um, economics qualifications, but I think I know what inflation is, and I think I know what a devaluing currency is. And sometimes someone who is not a professional economist but is reasonably conversant with the concepts can act as an intermediary between ordinary readers and the professionals, and that's the role that I try to play. And my final question is, who would you go to if you were real? I mean, God forbid you should, be, God forbid you should never be ill. I mean, please, God, may you live to 120, perfectly healthy. But if you were ill, would you go to somebody who has read all these books? Would you go to a doctor? I might read their column. There's uh, someone on this side, a um, gentleman here with both of his hands up, uh, Felice. <laughs> um, hello. Uh, my question is very simple, and it's really one word, which is why. I'm assuming that these mania that we're seeing now have arisen much more in the last 20, 30 years than they did in my youth. Mm -hmm. Why do you think... Well, there's, no, you know, I, I know we're bored to death blaming social media for absolutely everything. Um, but there's clearly an element here of the rapidity of, of communication. And there's something about the form of communication we're, we're using which lends itself to mass formation psychosis. If we're going to use the fancy word. Um, because it's a kind of pylon, you know, that is an expression with Twitter, and that really, what it is, it's, it, it is, it is a technology that makes it possible to, on a, in a very personal way, to just, to, say, to, to coin a movement, me too. I've never thought there was a better named um, you know, crowd craze than me too. They're all me too's, really. Um, so that has to be an element. That identifying that doesn't, it's not an answer. It doesn't keep them from happening. It's just something to be aware of. That, that, and because to me, I mean, we've always had social manias. They're, they're, or, or, you know, suddenly everyone believes something and it turns out to be stupid. Um, and, the, you know, the most recent one that I could think of that isn't part of the, cluster that I'm talking about, it was not spread by social media, was the uh, recovered memory, memory syndrome, which destroyed a lot of families. It was actually tragic uh, when psychiatrists convinced their patients that they could dredge up these ancient memories from childhood and even infancy of having been abused, usually by their parents, sexually. and. Um, and then the patients would go back to the parents and throw down all these horrific ac accusations. It destroyed families forever. It's another example of, you know, Humpty Dumpty not getting put back together again once this is all over. Uh, but they're not, we've always been prone to groupthink. And, and it's one of the things that depresses me about us as a species. But it's worse now. They're, and they're on a larger scale. I mean, if you look at what happened with Black Lives Matter, uh, within a couple of days, that had spread internationally. And that's the real difference right now, I think, is that the manias go international. It, it doesn't even just stay in the country. And it travels almost instantaneously. Um, and the bigger it is, the more momentum it has. And the, you know, in other words, the bigger it is, the bigger it gets. You know, that until you, until you had uh, South Korea marching down the street of Seoul, 
with Black Lives Matter banners and they don't have any black people. I mean, what on earth? The, uh, so, I, I, I don't know, I, I don't know what, what the answer is aside from being able to step back individually and because it's very hard when something is overtaking you, that when you're in the midst of a, of, of a mania, it doesn't seem like that. It just seems like what's happening. It's the main thing. It must be the truth. It's what everyone is talking about. Everyone's saying the same thing. And you just have to start recognizing, oh, everyone is saying the same thing. That's a little weird. And furthermore, you can't say anything else if you express any kind of dissent, you are destroyed. In fact, that, that to me is one of the biggest indicators of a mania is you cannot differ with it without real risk to yourself. And that's why I'm so suspicious of the climate situation. Um, In defense of 21st century social manias, didn't we have pretty much their equivalent in the 20th century, which were the fascist movement, the communist movement, which led to an enormous loss of life, tyranny, societies oppressed for 70 years. And in some ways, if, if, if susceptibility to these mass hysterical movements is an ineradicable feature of human nature, isn't it better that it should be directed towards cancelling other people on Twitter and sort of virtue signaling <laughs> and moral grandstanding than it is in these kind of mass political movements which disfigured the 20th century. I mean, of course, things like the trans cult cause real world harm um, and people lost their livelihoods as a result of, you know, not complying with BLM dogma. But for the most part, they don't seem quite as horrific or as destructive as the manias that swept through the 20th century. So in that respect, shouldn't we defend them as a sort of less <laughs> toxic alternative? I mean, yes. If we're at least not in the middle of World War II, and um, maybe we should wake up every day and be thankful. Um, the trouble, I, I, I would be perfectly content to let this stuff wash over uh, Twitter or X. Uh, uh, Facebook, whatever, as long as people in positions of power ignored it. And I think that's where, um, where we've really been let down and why these movements have been important. Because, I mean, for example, the only reason that I'm still here, that I've managed to publish this book, is that I have a publisher that is willing to publish me. But there have been plenty of other writers in this period who have lost their publishers and therefore lost their voice. Well, you need people in positions of power who can make decisions and protect freedom of speech. And there have been all too many people across the board, across the institutions during this period who have completely capitulated and said, oh, no, there's a, there's a little storm on Twitter and it's going to make us look bad. Well, you know, sorry, can't publish you anymore and they're out the door, or you're fired. You know, and that's, that's where we failed, and I think that's what's shocking. And that's the, o that's the only reason that these things are important. If it were just a matter of, of people going nuts at their keyboards, well, then you're right. That's, then it's, it's a kind of safe uh, outlet for poisonous energy. Another question. Um, yes, there's a lady there with a green jumper. Can you reach her, Felicia? She's on this side of the aisle. Oh, Finney can get there first. Thank you. Thank you. You're the sanest voice we've heard for a long time. Thank you. Thank then you you're, you're, you're then also you're... here to see Lionel. No. <laughs> I got a question for both of you. OK, now what? Um, everybody in this room is probably with you in terms of being really dismayed, freaked out about these manias. But there are a lot of us around, underground. What do we do? Do you have any thoughts about it? How do we move forward? I mean, and as you say, even our politicians, the people in charge, are going along with it. Or they're so corrupt that they're just 
going along with it because it's, it's the convenient thing to do. So what do we do? How do we band together? Come to the Hippodrome. <laughs> uh, there, were, there was an entire population of people who distinguished themselves in relation to every single one of these hysterias that we're talking about. I think perhaps the most momentous being lockdown. And I, I, uh, I found some real heart in that, that, that there were people out there who were still capable of independent thought, who were willing to risk their reputations and often their careers to say this is wrong or this is ill thought out. Um, and I, I think we just need to find each other. I mean, Toby's Daily Skeptic is the first thing I read every morning, still. And, um, and it does, I mean, I'm not, I, I tend to be something of a loner, but I, I have to say that I find it surprisingly comforting that there is, dare I use the word, a community out there, because I know there are many other readers and other people writing for the site, and it makes me feel that I'm not alone and I'm not crazy. And, and I think that's an important feeling. Um, I had a funny uh, experience during the first lockdown. I, I decided to treat myself. And I ordered a side of smoked salmon. It's that outfit that you advertised on. You yeah. weren't advertising. You were just recommending it. Yeah. So, and I, and I ordered a, uh, my salmon. And along with the salmon came a note. We love your columns in The Spectator. Keep, keep it up. Thank you for opposing lockdown. And it, it was so bizarre. <laughs> You know, halfway across the country, I just wanted food, but it was it was just that that was a little you know, the community is out there. It's not just us, and I think in relation to all this stuff, there are people who are who are pushing back and saying enough. We're not putting up with it. I mean, I think for example, in the transgender stuff, it's been really important for parents to put themselves out there, and 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 to. Tr to interfere with their children's education. And it's, I think you do have to be active. It doesn't help just to stay home and say nothing and think this is a load of bollocks, <laughs> right? And, and you all, everyone has to decide for themselves what's the best way. Sometimes just being at someone's dinner party and being willing to say something rather than keep the peace and keep your mouth shut. Jan, can we have a couple of questions from people who are watching at home? Um, yeah. Remotely. Uh, okay, so a question about how do we help uh, young people avoid being infected by and exposed to the mania virus in societal settings? So should we go with that one first? Um. I think that it's important to expose people, and it's not just young people, but to expose people to other viewpoints. There are other viewpoints out there. If we had a competent education system, then you know, if you're covering climate change, you would cover both sides, right? And you would look at the evidence, and they're not doing that. But uh, if you're, incur if you're teaching people to think rather than just to imitate and to, to repeat, then there's nothing about today's young people that is more incompetent than anyone else. I don't think they're any less capable of absorbing conflicting information and making their, their decision for themselves. But they're often not being given conflicting information. They're just being given one side of any given issue, and that's just propaganda. So it's not entirely their fault. A lot of these people will little by little wake up to the fact that there's more than one side to this stuff. Uh, but in the meantime, in the meantime, they are they are the victims 
of the times. Can I say, if you do have um, a child um, or even um, uh, an adult offspring who is a fanatical green echo warrior, I recommend Climate the Movie as an antidote. Um, and it's, um, it's particularly good because it has a series of quite eminent scientists, including a Nobel Prize winner, debunking um, climate hysteria. And um, if you can make your, your um, uh, household green echo warrior sit through, it's only 80 minutes, I think that's a really good um, uh, antidote to all the propaganda they're being confronted with on a daily basis. Jan, one more question from people at home? Yes, so Jeremy says, uh, throughout history, humans have congregated around irrational beliefs. This appears to be human nature. So is it, um, it's almost an article of faith for FSU supporters that rational argument should prevail, but are we deluding ourselves that rational argument is sufficient? I think the main thing is just to be aware of the fact that though we do have a lot of pride in ourselves for being terribly modern. We have to remember that everyone in the present has always been proud of themselves for being terribly modern. And whatever we're doing right now, this too shall pass. We have to be constantly aware of the fact that we're not that special. Uh, the present is not that special aside from happening to be the present. It's the one thing that never lasts. Um, and we're still, we just have to remember, we're still capable of getting really idiotic notions in our heads on a mass scale. And I think that's a start. And that's why I wrote this book. I am more disturbed about the larger phenomenon of our susceptibility to getting swept up into often completely irrational and destructive ideas then I am disturbed by any single one of the examples that we've talked about tonight. Should we have um, three questions in quick succession and then we'll come back to Lionel. So gentleman here with his hand up, just, yeah. Oh yes, Lionel. Um, do you think it's mere coincidence that these manufactured manias coincide so nicely with the WEF agenda? Okay, and there was, I think the chap on the other side of you also had a question, yeah. Um, going back to the question of, um, about what do we do about this, surely the first thing we should do is to stop calling these authoritarians liberal. It, it drives me completely mad when I read yeah. columns by Rod Little and Sherelle <laughs> Jacobs calling these people hyper-liberal. Yeah. The, the fight back liberal. has to start with us giving these people the label they deserve. I don't know what that necessarily is, but that is something we as a, a broad movement should start discussing. We've got to wake people up to what is happening. One more question. There's a gentleman down here, Felice. Uh, linked to the last two questions, uh, I think a lot of this is to do with cause and symptoms. So the symptom might be the mania, the cause is the underlying ideology, and I think as Mark was saying back there, I think a lot of this is to do with what's been taught in universities, what's got into institutions. There's this social justice uh, theory what Thomas Sowell calls cosmic justice because it's just so out of this world, it's, it's nonsense. But people buy into it, and I think that's it. So I think the fundamental cause is the ideology. The other bits with it around BLM, stuff like that, the, the mania, the social contagion, the, the, me, the, media, the media is the medium. Okay, um, so three questions there. To what extent are these manias manufactured by bad actors like the WEF who mm. have some agenda? Um, are we making a, a terrible mistake in referring to the exponents of these social hysterias as, in any sense, liberal? And um, final question. Um, uh, the way I heard that, which wasn't quite how you asked it, was, um, uh, and, but thinking about Thomas Sowell's analysis and distinction between the constrained and unconstrained vision, one of the reasons these manias take root and spread so quickly is because there is a kind of desire for justice, a kind of unsatisfied um, uh, uh, appetite for kind of wanting to do moral good. Vision and a vision of the anointed. Is that, is, that, is that the part of human nature which these manias are connecting with and which gives them such velocity? Take them in any order you like. <laughs> Okay, regarding the WEF and whom you called bad actors, I think this ties into all of these really. The, 
the people behind this stuff really do believe that they are doing good. So it's almost never the case that the people pushing these ideologies are deliberately maligned, are trying to do any real damage. They genuinely embrace their, this whole way of thinking. Um, and they think that they're going to make the world a better place. Anybody who tells you that, <laughs> leave the room. Um, I've never said that. I do not write novels to make the world a better place. I write novels to amuse myself. I don't know how much there is in it, the conspiracy of uh, the WEF, the, the, all the billionaires, and, and trying to make sure that we own nothing and we're happy. When it comes to the general argument, I know you've had this ongoing argument um, between uh, is it conspiracy or is it incompetence? I'm always with incompetence. Um, see book. Um, I don't believe, even with all their money, they have the power to, to do this all the, by themselves. So there's certainly, especially with the climate thing, there's a lot of money behind it. Um, and and uh, if, if that's all we're facing, I think we're okay, honestly, because these people are, I mean, they have a lot of money, but they're not all that much, that, that bright and they're not necessarily good at manipulating literally billions of people. Um, number two, the liberals. You're right, liberal is the wrong word, and it's, you know, I find it comical that we now separate off so-called classical liberals from the whatever kind of liberals, the crazy liberals. Um, and you know, that's why that word woke came along. I mean, that's why it was, uh, in fact, lifted from the other side because it's so concise. Now, I'm, I'm sure, along with the rest of you, uh, we, we're all sick of it, right? It's a tiresome word, but it's at least unisyllabic and over quickly. <laughs> I, I don't know what else to call them. It, at least for a lot of people, seems to communicate the kind of person that you're talking about. In my nonfiction, I try to avoid that word because I'm sick of it. But, you know, for now, we're probably stuck with it. Sometimes I use the word progressive, which I notice, you know, that's a, an American term that I've noticed that the, that the British have now brought over that, oh, what a surprise, <laughs> right? Um, and, and, you know, for progressive, progressives like that word because they think, that it's necessarily flattering. But as I've written elsewhere, you can progress into a pit. <laughs> so I consider it, at, the, at best, a neutral word. Um, but yeah, I think the use of word, putting the word liberal anywhere near these people is foolish. And any thoughts about how um, that yearning for social justice, for a better world, wanting to do good, so often leads to hell? Um, yeah, it's one of the great mysteries. And, you know, all, all the, all the more, much more horrible and consequential manias, uh, we, we don't think of it that, that way, but that still, that is what, what those movements are. Uh, they still had people thinking that, that that they were improving matters, at least for their own people. You know, Hitler was out there, obviously he was an egomaniac, but he also thought that he was going to make the German people everything they were always meant to be, you know, their, their very best selves. He was going, he was creating a utopia, and all these people who want to create utopias, ultimately, if they have any influence at all, create dystopias. And I'm left with just not wanting to make the world a better place. I mean, I just, in a very small way, make my life okay. I don't tell my friends that I don't want to have dinner with them anymore because I disagree with them politically, you know? And that is my version of virtue. 
OK. I think we've got time for... Let's have, um, let's have um, three final questions. Did you, have any, what, did you have one you wanted to throw in, Jen, from anyone watching at home? OK. Uh, so, yeah. Can we have... There's, there's, there's a woman over here, Vinay. <laughs> Sorry if we've been neglecting you, madam. It's not personal, I know. <laughs> Hi. Um, so, just thinking back about all the different manias... Um, what's been happening since October 7th, particularly in Western civilization, And you, you, the state that we've got to where liberals, progressives, woke, are now supporting Hamas, Hezbollah, and as of Sunday, Iran. Um, would you class what's happened to Israel as another mania? And just going on from that um, to Toby, your point about, you know, kind of, it's all happening on Twitter, so no harm, no foul. But actually, you, what's happening in the West is validating what's happening in Israel. And I think, you know, the woke embrace of essentially death cult jihadism mm. really does have an effect. Oh, thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm really glad you brought that up. Uh, do you want to say that now? Okay. Yeah, well, I think it's better. I don't want to have to remember one. three questions. Um, <laughs> I, th I thought they really tipped their hand, right? Willing to turn a blind eye to what Hamas did in Israel on October 7th within about 24 hours. I mean, they were, they were out on the street before Israel had been able to, to, to say even, like, was that, was that nice? Um, they, hadn't, they hadn't hurt anybody. And it was really interesting in that usual interesting slash depressing way that these same people just immediately went out on the streets and got all excited about the Palestinians, regardless of, of what they do, and that you even had these, uh, you know, transgender, I mean, there was some big transgender... <laughs> occasion recently and nobody showed up because they were all out there marching for Palestine. And <laughs> it's hilarious. And, you know, th that just betrays these people as, you know, first immoral and also just hopelessly and mindlessly conformist. So they'll go out, if they get the memo that this is what they're supposed to get all excited about now, they'll They'll be out on the street in, 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 a, in a second. So, you know, I think it's pathetic. And I think it's shameful. I know there was um, a piece in the Free Press um, yesterday, I think, about a group of pro-Palestinian protesters in an American city, and they'd convened to plot their next protest, and the um, Iranian drone attack on Israel w w w took place at the meeting. And so they then started up with a pro-Iranian chant. They were Americans. Um, and the, the curious thing was they were all wearing masks. This was yesterday. I mean, it, was, um, uh, it couldn't have been more illustrative of the point you've just made. Should we have one more question, and then we'll go to the book signing. You had someone over there, Felice, that, uh, yeah. Um, I really enjoyed the novel, uh, Lionel. Uh, it was fantastic. Thank you. Um, and I'm loath to spoil the ending, but, um, which is a lot more complex than I'm about to let on. But basically, the mania does conclude. It comes to an end. And I was wondering if you felt it, you're compelled to conclude it in your capacity as a storyteller. Or if you think something like this would perpetually, uh, potentially just last forever. Because we've mentioned some manias that really do exist. And um, as far as I see it, none of them have really come to an end, at least in my lifetime. Uh, th these are the kind of the post-internet manias. Mm. So I was wondering what your thoughts on that would be. Um, you're right. Most, most manias kind of dwindle rather than having a clear conclusion. And of course, on a narrative level, that's not very satisfying. And so my loyalty at a certain point is not to historical accuracy and verisimilitude, it is to story. And I have to tell you a good story. And it's much more gratifying 
to bring the, that mania to a firm conclusion. And I'm not going to go farther than that, but it's not, it doesn't simply end, let's just put it that way. Um, we go somewhere else. And that's, a, by the way, this is just my perception. I do think this, this has some verisimilitude. Manias don't so much end as just get subsumed by another mania, certainly lately. Um, and that is indeed what happens. Okay, well, um, uh, let's, uh, let's conclude it there. But don't forget that if you want a signed copy of this excellent book, um, you can get one right over there. And Lionel will be remaining behind on stage to sign your copy. And if you want to have supper, there's the Heliot or the Chop Chop restaurants, and you can get 20% off just by showing your digital tickets. Um, in the book, um, uh, Pearson concludes at the end, when reflecting on the difference between her and Emery, that the critical difference is that Emery is just better adjusted than her. She's more of a social animal. She's better at making friends. She's better at reading the room. She's not tone deaf in the way that um, Pearson is. And it's, it's, it's the fact that Pearson is slightly maladjusted and doesn't have many friends and isn't a particularly social animal that enables her to withstand this kind of mass hysteria. It just doesn't lift her up like it does Emery because she is kind of uh, genetically just much more uh, socially maladjusted. But actually, I think that that slightly underestimates um, and does, does a, an injustice to the people who do take a stand against these manias, whether in fiction or non-fiction. I think it does take uh, real courage, moral courage, which is probably the most precious courage there is. So can everyone join me in giving our morally courageous novelist and columnist a big round of applause?